One of the things that's really improved in the ENT space over the last 10 to 20 years is the advent of smaller, more feasible in-office CT imaging for sinus problems. It used to be that doctors would have to send out patients to the hospital or an outpatient imaging facility and they would lay on the table and get a CT scan with a relatively high dose of radiation and quite expensive compared to what we offer today in the office. With the advent of these smaller, easily installed in the office setting scanners, they also were able to reduce the radiation dose applied to the patient per scan. So this has allowed us as sinus specialists or rhinologists to obtain images and take some of the guesswork out of patient care when it comes to both nasal obstruction symptoms and especially chronic sinusitis. Why is this important? Well, chronic sinus symptoms often mimic allergies, viral or repeated viral illnesses, a lot of those conditions that induce swelling and mucus and all of those symptoms in the nose look about the same when you talk to a patient and kind of get a history of symptoms. How long those symptoms are there certainly can help indicate when there's a chronic problem versus a more acute problem. But just having talked to a lot of sinus patients over the years, it's quite challenging just using history alone or a basic exam or even nasal endoscopy alone to always figure out which ones actually have sinus problems versus which ones just have bad allergies and repeated viral illnesses from exposures. So CT takes all the guesswork out of figuring out and determining the best treatment plan for those patients. So now that we know why CT is important, I'm gonna show you images of what our scanner looks like in one of our offices. So these new scanners are quick. They only take 30 seconds to a minute to obtain the images. They process relatively quickly and then we immediately have access to those images while the patients are there in the clinic with us. This is a big advantage when it comes to making on the spot treatment decisions. The alternative is sending that patient out, having them go to an imaging center, obtain a CT scan, have them obtain the images on a disc and bringing it in at a separate visit so that we could go over the images and make decisions. So the advent of office CT scanners takes that delay out of the treatment algorithm. So as we can see on this CT scan, there's a combination of white, black, and gray shades, and this reflects the density that's captured in the images on a CT scan. Bone, teeth, anything that's calcified or hard in nature is going to be dense and bright white. Air is going to be black, such as these lines that make up the nasal airway. Soft tissues like the turbinates and the skin over the face are going to be shades of gray. And we use the changes in density, which outline the anatomy or the structures in the nose, to identify what we're looking at structure-wise and also see if there's any abnormalities. Once we see those pictures of that patient's CT scan, we can instantly recognize problems with anatomy that might cause their nasal obstruction symptoms such as a deviated septum, large or hypertrophied nasal turbinates, uh, large middle turbinates containing concha bullosa, which are abnormal sinus cavities within the middle turbinates that make them much larger than usual and affect airflow and sinus function and other anatomical or inflammatory problems such as nasal polyps, defects where bone is missing or overgrown in certain areas of the nose or sinus drainage pathways that might make procedures more challenging. Next, we'll go over some examples of CT scans of patients with various problems, starting with my CT scan that we obtained when the scanner was first installed and we were just testing the equipment out. In this example, which is actually my CT scan, we're seeing a little bit of septal deviation where the septum isn't perfectly straight off to the right, leading to a little more right-sided airway narrowing compared to the left side there. We're seeing a little bit of turbinate hypertrophy or enlargement, and that's something that's going to change based on how swollen the turbinates are due to allergies, colds, and things of that nature. As we get further back, we're seeing a bone spur actually sticking out to the left side in the back of the septum. Sometimes those cause symptoms, sometimes they don't, and a lot of times it depends on how big they are and how much they contact the adjacent structures in the nose. And we're seeing the insides of the sinuses. So these are the maxillaries, these are the ethmoids between the eyes. If we come back forwards, this is the frontal sinuses in the forehead. If we go all the way back, these are the sphenoid sinuses in the middle of the head. And inside the sinuses, we're just seeing air, which are what we expect to see in the case of somebody without sinus problems, just air, no significant buildup of mucus and no significant thickening of the lining. When somebody has sinus disease, as we'll see in a few moments, they have a thick gray layer over much of the sinus or a blockage with a fluid level inside the sinus, which reflects sinus problems. 
As you can see on my CT imaging, I actually have a deviated septum. And my turbinates are slightly enlarged on at least one side at a time. And my sinuses appear normal. There's no significant thickening in the walls of my sinuses. So I would be a good example of somebody with occasional nasal congestion problems that tends to respond fairly well to the topical nasal steroid sprays like X-Hands, which I've been using for about one to two years at this point. If my congestion problems get worse uh, and I was in the reverse position of seeing a rhinologist for my problems, I would expect them to tell me that I need a septoplasty and possibly a turbinate reduction procedure to optimize my nasal breathing long term when those nasal sprays are failing. On example two, we're gonna look at a CT scan of somebody with chronic low-level symptoms. This is somebody who's always had a little bit of congestion, always had a little bit of drainage, and it could be allergies, it could just be they get a cold and their symptoms last a while after each cold. And this is a good example of probably the majority of patients that come in for possible sinus problems. So in this example, we're seeing significant turbinate hypertrophy giving this patient nasal congestion, but the septum is relatively midline, so that's not a contributor. We're also seeing more mucosal thickening or thicker gray areas that make up parts of the ethmoid sinuses, a thicker gray lining at the floor of the maxillary sinus, particularly on that left side. And if we scroll to the very back, the sphenoid in the back also has some thickness, the mucosal lining around the walls of the sphenoid on the left side how long that problem is there and how many symptoms that tends to cause helps guide in this patient are they going to need surgery or is this somebody that responds well to medicines and those symptoms go away and we can assume that they're safe and symptom free um, for a prolonged period of time after that treatment in that case they may or may not need any kind of procedure to achieve better results long term Example number three, we're going to look at a scan from a patient that had chronic nasal obstruction symptoms and on and off drainage that was not obviously infected. So a lot of time this drainage was thick and sticky and possibly allergic in nature, but not definitively purulent or a bacterial infection. And in these cases, they can be very tricky because obstruction and drainage alone feels like allergies to a lot of these patients. And when they come in and we get a CT scan, in this case, we uncovered fairly substantial sinus problems that this patient had no idea were there. On this CT, what we're seeing is significant opacification or thickness and swollen tissue and mucus filling most of the sinuses, including this right frontal sinus, which is relatively small, the recess of the left frontal sinus, which again is underdeveloped due to the age of this patient. We're also seeing fluid levels in the maxillary sinuses on both sides, which have more of a flat appearance compared to the bumpy or rounded polyp-like swelling that we often see when it's just swelling and inflammatory change. The ethmoid cells are, for the most part, opacified on the left and partially opacified on the right. As we go a little further back, the sphenoid sinuses have swollen areas with some mucus buildup on the right side, but a little bit of swelling, not a lot of mucus buildup on the left side. So this is, again, a patient that's significantly congested but did not have an obvious sinus infection despite the appearance of her CT scan. This is a good example of a patient with significant chronic sinusitis that's going to notice a big improvement in their quality of life once they have surgery, once they get all of their sinuses under good control with topical therapies after surgery, once the sinuses are open to allow that topical therapy into the sinuses. On example number four, we're going to look at a patient with severe nasal polyp disease. This is an example of somebody who generally knows they have a sinus problem. They're very obstructed most of the time. They often have a very dull sense of smell. They don't always experience pain or purulent drainage, but those things can come and go based on um, viral infections making their symptoms worse at times or based on bacterial super infections that may come and go over the long course of their underlying sinus disease. So in this case, the patient presented with a known history of nasal polyp disease. And as we scroll back, we're actually seeing polyps sitting in the front of the nasal airway on both sides. And just back a little ways, we're seeing complete opacification of the frontal sinuses, maxillary sinuses, and ethmoid sinuses on both sides. One interesting thing to point out, sometimes there's changes in the density of material inside a given sinus. That's one clue we're looking at when we're seeing a patient with this type of disease to determine if they might have allergic fungal sinusitis, which often involves really thick, often calcified or solid debris inside the sinuses. In her case, it's not calcified or we would see brighter white speckled patterns within this debris. 
but there are different density patterns visible inside the sinus, which could be a combination of mucus and swollen tissue and polyp within the sinus. As we get further back, the posterior ethmoids are both opacified on both sides, and we have sparing of the sphenoid sinuses as far as polyp is concerned, but we do see fluid levels as they're obstructed and can't drain forward out of the face of those sinuses. They do retain mucus and get fluid levels. The reason this patient's nose has this appearance is sometimes airborne allergies don't quite reach the back of the nose, so the sphenoid sinuses might be spared some of the exposure that leads to the degree of swelling we see more anteriorly within her nose, but because of all the swelling, we don't see adequate drainage of these back sinuses so they can have fluid levels such as in this case. So the back of the nasal airway here is also completely obstructed. As we go back a little bit further, this space here is the nasopharynx and this should be widely opened. But right here, we're actually seeing a large polyp hanging all the way behind the nasal airway and into the nasopharynx. So if the palate would be here, that would be a, the back end of a polyp about to hang down the back of the throat. And this is definitively a patient that would not be a good candidate for an office procedure. These nasal polyp cases tend to take longer. They require larger openings to guarantee that topical medicines can reach the insides of the sinuses to achieve those lasting outcomes and avoid more surgery down the road. This is somebody who might require a three hour or longer procedure with the maximum dimension sinus openings to guarantee a good long-term result. In this case, this patient will achieve a great lasting result, most likely with a combination of good sinus surgery, followed by good topical therapy in the form of a nasal steroid spray like Exhance or a medicated rinse that contains steroid and possibly an antihistamine or other medications on and off as needed. They may also require an additional drug, however, and this is a category of patient that we sometimes prescribe biologic medications for. Biologics like Dupixent alter the immune regulating chemicals that are in our bloodstream, helping the immune system communicate and drive up or drive down certain types of inflammation. And when severe nasal polyp disease is present, a lot of times topical steroids aren't enough to achieve complete control of that polyp growth. Biologics, however, are extremely successful in that patient population, which is a small subset of the overall collection of patients with nasal polyp disease. Hopefully this was helpful. If you feel like you have nose problems, sinus problems, anything that we might be of assistance with, please don't hesitate to come see us at my Houston Surgeons. Thanks.